You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast, Breaking Barriers and the Mind, Body, and Wealth Connection with Lauren Simmons. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. Every week, you'll hear me bringing you inspiring stories, educational interviews, and some solo episodes to help you on your journey to financial freedom and independence. So let's get started. Today's guest is someone really special. You may have heard of her, maybe you didn't, but let me explain who Lauren Simmons is. Lauren Simmons broke a barrier at the New York Stock Exchange by becoming the youngest full-time female trader on the floor in 2017 at, get this, just 22 years old. She was also just the second Black woman to trade on the floor. That's crazy, right? She has since left Wall Street and now serves as a personal finance speaker, author, producer of her own life story, and now host of Entrepreneurs.com new docuseries, Going Public. The Going Public series actually premieres on October 19th, so you should be able to check that out right now because this episode comes out after that. So I'm so excited to bring this conversation to you. Hopefully you're inspired and motivated to go after it and to break barriers yourself. So let's get into it. Now a word from our sponsor, Digital Federal Credit Union, DCU. Choosing to bank at a credit union is not only beneficial for your wallet, but for your community too. You can improve your financial health and make a statement with your dollars by choosing where you bank. With the lack of accessibility and trust that most people have with the traditional banking system, credit unions are a direct solution to leveling the playing field for your banking needs. You're not just another customer at a credit union, you are a member who matters. Also, at DCU, they place an enhanced focus on financial education by offering learning modules on key financial topics like budgeting, saving for the unexpected, building credit, and much more. DCU also offers a secured credit card that helps individuals establish or improve their credit by borrowing securely against their DCU savings account. To learn more, check out dcu.org. If you want the episode show notes for this episode, go to journeytolaunch.com or click the description of wherever you're listening to this episode. In the show notes, you'll get the transcribed version of the conversation, the links that we mentioned, and so much more. Also, whether you are an OG journeyer or brand new to the podcast, I've created a free jumpstart guide to help you on your financial freedom journey. It includes the top episodes to listen to, stages to go through to reach financial freedom, resources, and so much more. You can go to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart to get your guide right now. Okay, let's hop into the episode. Hey, journeyers. So I have a special guest on the podcast. I know I say all my guests are special, but she's really special. (laughs) We have Lauren Simmons on the podcast and You may have heard of Lauren's story, you may have not, but by the time you listen to this episode, you'll know all about her and all the amazing things that she has going on. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to be here. Hello, everyone listening. Ah, this is going to be a great conversation. It is. And by the way, so I read your full like intro before we started, so they heard that. But when I first saw and read your story about you being like, I still I can't believe that that's like this was still like happening to this day that you were the youngest female full-time trader on wall street yep right and then the only second black female full-time trader on wall street the second black equity trader yes and what year was this 2017 which is wild that this is like still the we're still doing the first i know or or marginal numbers less than 10 yeah no it it absolutely is is crazy but i i always want to pay respect to the women that have come before me. And so the first equity trader to come to the floor was Martina Edwards. And the first African American woman to ever be on the trading floor who was not a trader, but she was a C holder was Gail Pankey. And that was back in 1978. Martina, I believe worked there in 2008 ish. 
that's a pretty large gap. And then I came along in 2017. So crazy. I've since left and and still I don't I don't think that there's another African American woman to come back to the floor. So just just insane. It is insane. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as I was trying to research and read more of your story, I did find some things. I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's why. So I'd love to um, talk about that a little bit more. But I want to talk about what led you to Wall Street, because I know at first that was not your goal. You were like heading towards like more of the medical field, right? Yeah. So my background, I um, my four years of high school, we had to pick a program that would lead us through all four years. I don't remember uh, stepping into my freshman year what I wanted to pick now that I'm like going back, but I didn't end up getting the choice that I wanted and ended up in architectural engineering. So I studied all four years architectural engineering. I was the only woman in that class, and I was one of the few African Americans that was in that class. I had to pivot. Once I got to college, because I didn't get into an architectural engineering program, and I went into genetics because I really wanted to impact families the way the doctors had impacted mine. I have a brother with a disability and had to pivot again. A very long story short, I was writing my senior thesis, and I realized that we weren't as technologically advanced as I had hoped when it came to studying genetics. But what I knew is that I really wanted to move to New York City um, I couldn't tell you what was calling me, but I was going to leverage my statistics and analytical background that I had developed over eight years. And I moved to New York City. And the question that everyone always asks, how did you pick finance? I did not pick finance. Um, finance chose me. I had networked with a whole so many different people and a gentleman that worked at a large financial institution, you guys can can name him, um, told me flat out that his company would not hire me, but would I be open to applying for an equity trading position at the New York Stock Exchange? I said yes, without a doubt, and came to the floor and within five minutes was offered a job at the New York Stock Exchange. And the rest is history. <laughs> wow. I love these like stories where, you know, you start at one point, you have no clue that's what you're going to do, but it's like literally like there is, you can't deny, like it's so obvious that this is what is meant for you or your calling. Like you said, you didn't choose choose this life, the life chose you. Yeah. And I think it's evident and kind of like, even like your, your sense, what you've done, like it's all kind of like have just been stepping stones, like to lead you where you are. So going back to being an equity trader as the only, well, at the time you were the only woman on the floor. Yes. And the youngest. Yes. My first question is just like, why aren't more women going for this job? Like this man, he said to you, hey, take this like, or, or apply for this. Why weren't any other women doing this? What is that barrier that prevents women from stepping into this role? I don't think there is a barrier. If, if there is a barrier, then it, it, it definitely has to do with like us and like our, our own inner critic that men and women both have. Um, but I think women allow that fear to not push them forward. But I will say prior to me coming to the trading floor, I was in a room with 250 men. The floor has slowly dwindled. It probably is less than 250 men that now work on the trading floor. But this used to be a place that was booming in the sense of there were over thousands of people that worked on the floor. And so historically, you know, for, for there to be one woman there was 250 men. So it's kind of always been on par. I mean, if there were thousands, there was at least four or five women that were on the floor. And, you know, as time has gone on and developed, there have been less and less women. So I don't think that part of it is strange, but I do think outreach is everything. I, I think giving kids exposure and, and letting them know, like, you can do different things in different spaces. And for me, obviously, growing up, I don't, I never had on my radar, I wanted to be at the New York Stock Exchange, but I've always been a person that if you gave me an opportunity, I was going to be the best that I could in that opportunity and, and take it for what it was. And, and that had happened so many times before in my life, whether it was architectural engineering or genetics, but even like I one day had got in my head that I wanted to become a lifeguard. And I know that you know, at 16 years old, that that might sound so cliche, like, how is that a big deal? But one night, I said, I really wanted to become a lifeguard, I had to do this pre interview. I did the pre interview passed, I like ran home telling my mom, like, I got a job as a lifeguard. And she looked at me and she goes, you don't know how to swim. 
<laughs> and, <laughs> and and so we swam laps all night long, all night long in our pool um, until I knew how to swim. And the, ne- the next day I went in and I had to do the swim portion of the exam. And I was out swimming people that were on competitive swim teams. Um, I stayed with that job up until like my sophomore year of college, but I ended up being promoted to the head aquatics director over the aquatics department and again was also in a space where I was um, not the only woman, but I was the only uh, woman of color to, to do that. And so all that to say, you give me an opportunity or if something gets in my head, like I'm going to just take what I what I will from it. It'll be a learning lesson minimum, give it two years, um, use those transferable skills. And so I, I would encourage, it doesn't really matter what phase or age you are at, in your life, but if an opportunity comes to you, don't run away from it. Like be open. You have no idea where life is going to take you and what door that's going to open is going to lead you to the next door. So I think if you can just take opportunities and and you have to also like have that self-awareness and what feels good to you because every opportunity is not going to feel good to you. But if there is a, a fear or this negative emotion that is associated with an opportunity, really check in with yourself. Like, are, are you afraid because of failure? Are you afraid because you won't be able to do it? And if those are really none of the above, then why not? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, you know, like you really only live one life and I just figure like, take it fully and, and enjoy it and enjoy the opportunities and don't look at negative as negative and like take all of these as learning experiences. Yeah. And then the second part of that, cause I was long winded is like, yeah, I think hiring practices overall should do better with outreach as far as like getting more minorities and women into these spaces um it doesn't fall solely on the lauren simmons of the world to reach out to different people to say like hire me those organizations are going to have to do better and they're going to have to do better at not just limiting themselves to the ivy leagues and or the top hbcus like wait they're like black people go to many different schools and (laughs) they're all around the country and so how do we how do we bridge that? And and there are so many ways to do it. We live in a digital era where we have accessibility to any and everyone. So at this point, especially in 2021, going into 2022, there really is no excuse of the outreach and, and being able to connect with people. Yeah. I mean, you touched on really great points. I mean, part of it is like the when you when you're talking about us being in spaces or just being anyone reaching out to do something, there's like that internal kind of what you can control. So your mindset, what you're going to choose to go after. And then there's the kind of like that top bottom external, which is what you're talking about, like the hiring practices. But for most of us right now in our ecosystem, like you, it's like our mindset and habits. And I love that you brought up the story about swimming because literally like this shows that it doesn't matter what subject or field it is in. If you put your mind to something, you'll, you'll go after it. And I think that's like, hopefully will be motivating to people because maybe you're not going to go to the trading floor. Like if you're listening to this, you know, but maybe you've been wanting to learn how to swim and you've been putting that off. Right. And it's just like, go do it, go do it. Like, like Lauren said, this is one life. So one of the things that I did read about like, like being on the trading floor and I'm wondering if this was a barrier or if things have changed since is that you didn't really get paid a lot actually to be on the floor is like as a salary. Is that true? No. That is very true. Yes. So I only uh, got paid 12000 And then I think I ultimately, after fighting and, and fighting is a strong word, but bringing it to their attention that I was getting paid below minimum wage. And this was uh, 2018. And I don't remember the minimum wage at the time, but I think in New York City, New York was $11.25 an hour. I could be wrong. Someone could check me on that. But whatever it was, I thoroughly had did my research and I was like, I should be getting paid that, which equated to about forty eight, fifty thousand 50000 a year. So I know so that they were like, well, no way we're paying you that. <laughs> and they ended up paying me as an hourly associate. So there is a, again, every state is different. Um, and I'm coming from Georgia to New York, but there is a, for New York City, New York, there is an hourly minimum, and then there is a salary minimum. I'm not going to get into all of that, but there is a difference. And so technically, I was a salaried worker. They put me, they put me down to an hourly worker, but I was still 
getting a solid 40 hours a week and whatever. Um, all that to say, yes, I really only got paid 12000 And after bringing it to their attention, I think I was bumped up my last two months being on the trading floor to about 21000 But after I got that promotion, that raise, whatever you want to call it, I think for me, I had always in the back of my mind knew I was only going to be on the trading floor for two years. I knew this. Um, and that was something, again, that I mentioned earlier in this interview, give yourself two years, learn all the tools and resources. Maybe you love the job. Maybe you don't use these transferable skills and then go on to your next job. You have a good exit strategy. And I think for me, I knew regardless of the pay that I was always going to leave after two years. Um, my other colleagues that started in those entry level positions as well was also getting po- paid 12000 So I don't want people to think like, oh, it's because she was a woman, it's because she's black. Like, no, everyone was was getting paid that. But on the flip side of that, there were other firms working on the floor where the starting salary, same position that I was doing was $120,000, $185,000. And people always ask, well, how does that work? Like, is that something you negotiate? Like, I break it down to the firms on the trading floor is very much like the NFL. They're all house under one organization, but each, you know, team, each firm has its own rules and regulations as far as like compensation, HR practices, et cetera, et cetera. Like as far as like the rules and regulations and the how you play in the NFL, like those are all the same, but like how an organization functions on in their operational side is different from each, each firm. So um, I learned, you know, having open conversations and, and not being nosy, just like I, I learned from other colleagues that were my same age working at different firms that their entry was one hundred and twenty, one hundred and eighty five thousand. And so obviously that wasn't discouraging. It just was, OK, that's the number. You knew what that was. Yeah. I knew that when I was thinking of my exit strategy that I would not get anything less than one hundred and twenty thousand because I know people in this position get paid this. And I just let that be. Everything doesn't have to be a negative thing or like, you know, like I also learned there was so much value add in those two years on the floor. So I obviously don't love the pay and I didn't have to struggle, but like everything happens for a reason and and I don't regret it. And it, you know, it's part of my story and I move forward and I said, okay, like this is the number that's in my head and and let's just, you know, move forward with life. Right. Well, I'm just glad where you talk about that. And again, how important is it to talk to your colleagues and even people who are in the same type of job, different company to see what they're getting paid? Because if you didn't do that, then I mean, I'm sure you would have found out at some point, but it's better that you have those open conversations. And I'm just like, this is now just being curious, like what would make the people who who are worked for your company want to stay there? Like, was there another upside that they would get? (laughs) You know, it's crazy because after it was brought to my attention that someone was making 120,000, you know, the men at my firm were in denial. They were like, no, they must be doing a different job. And I was like, you know, the job, you know, the jobs that we're all doing. Like we, we know, like, let, let's not, let's, let's not be, let's not be obtuse. (laughs) Yeah. I'm trying to think of like a nice word, but yeah, like, you know, whatever their decisions were, was their decisions. Maybe they were comfortable in the, in the role and, you know, there were men had that have been working for the firm for, you know, over a decade and was only getting paid 60000 So I knew that if I had stayed in the same position for the same company, the growth was just not going to be there. Um, that was something that they were comfortable with. I can't, you know, go into the mindset of like the why. Were they, were they getting any additional upside that I was getting? No. Right, right. Okay. I mean, I was just, I was just curious. I'm sure other people listening were like, what's that about? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, we had thorough conversations. And so, yeah, a lot of it was like, there's no way they must be doing something different. And they were comfortable with their pay. They, they were comfortable with not fighting for additional. Cause I, I, again, and I don't want to use the word fighting. Like it was like a, a big thing. It just was, it was brought to my attention. I put it on a company email, like I should be getting paid more. They brought me upstairs and they were like, well, we're not going to pay you this, so we'll pay you that. And I just said, "Okay, everything is not worth the fight. You have to realize that you are also in control of your own life and you have the power. Everything is not worth the fight. I knew that there was not going to be an additional upside of like making this a fight, straining this relationship and just move forward, you know, and, and look at it more as a positive. And so, you know, anyone that's listening 
you you have the power. Okay, they don't they don't want to raise your pay, get another job. And I know that that's like simpler said than done, but it but it also is like okay, yeah. I don't I don't you don't have to deal with that headache. Just move forward and then go from there. Right. Well, speaking of moving forward, how did you make the decision <laughs> to eventually like leave? Um, because I'm sure at the time, like you did you did you realize like how groundbreaking it was at the moment, like that you were on the floor, you weren't even thinking about being the first of anything. You were just doing the work. I, I didn't I didn't think it was groundbreaking. The story came out a year after I had made history. So for me, it was like and and the and it's, and it's funny, like I'm grateful for the opportunity. But like, I, I do remember like before the year the story broke and I was telling people like, oh, like. I'm the second African American to ever be down here. And like, people just didn't care. And so I was like, okay. And then all of a sudden it became this thing where like everybody cared. And it was like, well, this is like old news. Like I, like I already had a process, which for me, by the way, was a bittersweet moment because I minimally wanted to make maximally at the time, wanted to make my family proud and my first job in my career. And it, you know, it was also disheartening to know like these marginalized numbers that I was the second african-american equity trader and the third african-american woman to ever be down there like those, those that's like really sucks but yeah so for me the the switch again i always knew after two years that i was going to leave so it was easy and it was really a crossroads of do i work for another financial institution which i had been interviewing and had been offered jobs or do i just say you know what let me live in my purpose in my purpose which we'll, you know, talk to uh, in a second, but but it's mostly of empowering that next generation when it comes to finances and investing. And so all of the work that I do is an extension of that. And that for me is a lot more rewarding than going to another organization like a Goldman or a JP. And by the way, when I was interviewing at those organizations, they told me that I was not allowed to continue to build my brand and I need it to be a product of the company. And I think in 2000, anything, but especially at the time, it was what, 2019, to say that when your brand is everything, it's how you get recognized. And, and, and I don't mean like in a comical sense, like you need to become a celebrity, like you can be your own brand within being a lawyer or a doctor or in finance or, or wherever, a teacher, like but like building your brand is is your resume and in this digital era where again everyone's so accessible people want to see your brand and i felt that that was really unjust and just really shows you know the traditional mindset that these institutions still have okay i have a special treat for you for the first time in 2021 terry ichioma of Trade and Travel, and I are teaming up to do a live webinar in class all about learning how to trade as a side hustle or your full-time hustle. Now, Terry is no stranger to the Journey to Launch podcast. She's been on episodes 154, episode 172, and I even invited her Trade and Travel students on the podcast on episode 173 to talk about their experience in the course, how they learn to trade. And so if you've been wondering what it's like to learn how to trade as a side hustle, or maybe you want to turn it into your full-time hustle, then you should come to this class. It's going to be on October 27th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up by going to journeytolaunch.com slash trade class. Once again, Terry Ijeoma and I are teaming up. If you wanted to learn more about how to trade, who's it for, who's it not for, why this is something you can consider if you're trying to do this as a side hustle to earn extra money for your goals. Come join us live on October 27th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Go to journeytolaunch.com slash trade class to sign up now. And you know what's crazy? It's just like, there's a power and I'm experiencing this myself. Like I also came from corporate, decided to, you know, do journey, a Zoom journey challenge on the side, started to do it now full time on my own now for a couple of years. And the trajectory of what I've been able to accomplish and make, like I would not have been able to conceive this if I would have stayed in that job. I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing. And I think it's fascinating. Similar to your story, it's just like from your mind, like from from people wanting to hear what Lauren says about this, from Lauren being the host and or distiller of this information or teaching this subject 
like that is so valuable. And I just feel like there's so many people who are stuck probably in a situation where they're with a company. And again, not everyone's meant to be an entrepreneur or to be kind of like in this space. But there are some people right now who have that ability and are afraid, and, you know, for good reason. Maybe they have mortgage and kids. They have to be a little bit more, you know, um, careful. But still, it's like stepping out on your own. Like there's no limit. Like there's no cap to what can be achieved when you do that. There isn't. There isn't. And and the, and the good foundation and the starting point. No, there is no limit. You can be limitless. But it's also like believing in yourself. No one else, No one in this world is going to champion for you more than you are. And so... I can give everyone the tools and the resources of how to invest, how to grow your money, how to diversify your money, all these things. But I look at everything from a like a holistic standpoint and looking at this mind, body, wealth connection. And for me, it really is like the most instrumental thing that you can do in this life for yourself is developing a relationship with yourself, getting that inner critic out of yourself, really believing that if you put your mind to something that you can do it. And I think when you can start at that place your finances are great, what you eat, how you look at your body, how you view this world. You know, Wayne Dyer has this quote, and I'm probably going to chop it because I always do, but it's something along the lines of uh, change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. And it's, and it's really true. And if you can just tap in, and I'm a person who's been meditating for over now seven years and have been on this self, self-help reading books journey for a while now, but i the moment that I made that switch and I just really believe that I can unlock anything that I, I want in my mind and for the things that I can unlock, you know, again, don't take these negative experiences as negative, like they're detours in the right direction. The moment that I made that switch, I saw not instantaneously because I don't want anyone to walk away from this thinking like, OK, tomorrow I'm, I'm a millionaire. Doesn't work like that. I mean, maybe, but we have to be like realistic I was able to go through those hard times. I was able, but I was also able to bet on me and say, you know what? This is going to work out. Maybe it's not going to work out today at the second, this moment. Maybe it won't even work out at 8 8 a.m. tomorrow, but maybe at noon tomorrow, there will be a shift. There will be a change. And I truly, um, you know, I'm not like a law of attraction is such a gimmicky thing, but I do believe that we are always attracting exactly what is meant to come to us good or bad and uh, how you look at those things dictates the next step in your journey in your life and speaking of that you talked about your purpose your passions now that you're now able to focus on so I know you have some like exciting things that you're you're doing and we're going to talk like all about that but what were some of the first steps that you started to do like once you left that job like how did you figure out your next step what was it like because there's so many opportunities probably that came to you. Um, There was, but it was still in this place of like, I am so independent. I'm so Leo. Like I don't ask for people. I don't ask help from people. That is like a flaw of mine. It really, it really is something that I'm intentionally working on. But for me, we've been working on this movie um, with AGC studios on my life story. And was really excited about that. And I, knew that I wanted to step out and be my own entrepreneur, but it was the asking for help was what was my roadblock. It was soundboarding ideas and trusting that the people that I was soundboarding wouldn't pretty much dump on my ideas and and make me feel smaller. And one day organically, and again, I, I also am a true believer that the things that you avoid the most will end up just coming full face in front of you. And you have to like, just go through that journey. But I had an idea in my mind that I wanted to create a TV series and never really like shared with anyone that, that this is like kind of what I wanted to do. And I I wanted to, again, have this accessibility to, to empower this next generation when it came to finance, et cetera, et cetera. And so just like, one night was talking to, I guess, a mentor. Yeah, I would call him a mentor. And just was talking, had no expectation. I was more or less ranting than talking about like my frustration of trying to like create this TV series. And just the long and short of it, he loved it. Like he was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is exactly what you need to do. And he was like, how can I help in that? And that was the moment that I could just be like, why was I holding this in? You know, I think everyone has these big ideas. And especially if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, 
it is okay to share your ideas. You don't have to share your ideas with everyone because everyone is not in a space to receive and people will project their fears and they will make you feel like you're crazy and all these other negative emotions. But I do believe that when you find your people, share with them, be authentic, be all honest, and they will always scale you to be better. And I am forever grateful that I took that leap, whether I was intentional about it or not, whether I was ranting or not, of, of saying, I'm going to do this. And I did it. And then um, and then I was able to to say, like, I have these other crazy ideas and I have this and I have that and and just be supported along the way. Right. And I think some people might be like, well, it's definitely important, like who, you know, but you su- you're, you're probably surprised of actually who, you know, and who they know. Because I, if I'm, if I'm like sitting, thinking and listening, I'm like, well, I don't maybe have access to someone who can help that come true, but maybe you do. You don't know that. If you put it out to your network, maybe that person knows the person that can put you in place with the other person that can help that happen. So, you know, be open with that. And so with that, like talk a bit about this series um, and like what came to be and what you're working on now. Yeah. So um, the, the TV series is still in development. <laughs> um all that to say, but my other show that again, I, I like, had I not put this out into the universe, I don't think these other opportunities would have come to me. But one of them being is going public that launches October 19th on entrepreneur.com. I cannot wait for you guys to see, but we are really democratizing the space when it comes to IPOs. Everyday investors, every day, you, me, anyone over the age of 18, globally will be able to invest in these companies that are on the show. um, And we get to see the company's journeys. We get to see the ugly, the good, the bad, the all of it. And hopefully through investing in some of these companies, we get to close the generational wealth gap. For people that don't really understand how groundbreaking this is, typically in order to be able to participate in an IPO, you need to have a net worth over a million dollars. A lot of us don't have that. Um, And so we are often left out of being able to buy into the next Amazon and the next Tesla. And if we could do that from the ground level, which you can with these incredible companies um, that are on the show, you really get to root for these companies. You really get to see the work that they put into it. And you really get to do your due diligence and look at these SEC circulars and, and really decide if you want to invest. But you have the potential upside of, you know, investing in a groundbreaking company that that could blow up and and be the next Tesla and Amazon of our generation. And so I'm excited that everyday people like you and me get to be able to, to, to have this opportunity because we often do not get afforded these opportunities. Yes. And I mean, again, fascinating how your background like makes you the perfect person, the perfect host for this show and to talk about it. And with that, like, I just love, um, like this whole idea. And that's like you said, we talked about this before, like the, the, the age of the social, of social media, as much as people say it's like not great and, you know, negative, which is true, is that there's so much access now, right? Like there's more access than ever before where you can learn from someone. We can listen to someone's podcast and get like tips, like from, you know, from them, like that you wouldn't necessarily have been able to do it. And so I think taking advantage of this, like using it for the positive that it can do to our lives is really key. Yeah. And and I will say that I, I believe, especially in the finance space, all this information has always been out there. Well, not just in finance, just in general, like everything has been in a book. But I do think we have come into a time where I won't say, yes, the accessibility is more there. But I do think that there's more people bringing awareness to it, where they can quickly do a Google search and find the answers that they need versus going to the library and checking out a book and going through the pages. But all the information has been there. So it is up to the audience of going public, but just people in general to to do your research. The answers that you're looking for, there's nothing new under the sun. And this this has not just to do with finance, but just a life circular thing in general. All of the answers and the tools are there. If you want the answers and the tools, you go out and you find the answers and the tools to do whatever you want to do in this life. Um, if there's anything that you, you know, could walk away from this conversation, it, it really is that. All, all the answers that you need is right here. 
Beautiful. That's beautiful, Lauren. And I mean, I just feel like there's, if you are a walking billboard from your life, like that's what it shows is possible. Like that could be done. Just a couple of things. I want to talk about your other projects. I know you have a podcast, um, you a book still in the works and you, a show. You still have that show you, you talked about that, you know, it's, it's still in the works. Also another one. And talk about how you're juggling all that, how you know what to prioritize. How do you get your creative juices flowing when it comes to like putting out like these kind of works? Uh, yeah, so my new podcast, uh, Mind, Body, Wealth, a Spotify original, only on Spotify. I pitched this, and again, this is where like the, the, these crazy ideas come up. I pitched this two years ago, so it's been a long journey. It's not anything that's happened overnight, and I'm so grateful. We debuted at number two on the top business podcasts in the U.S. charts, so that was incredible and just completely, I, I'm just, I, I'm just so grateful for the entire experience. For me, again, I'm, I'm in this lane where, again, I, I want to give people the accessibility. The information is out there and maybe they're, you know, not looking for it or maybe they don't know where to look for it. So it's nice to be able to speak and articulate it in layman's terms and in terms that makes sense and feels good to the people that are reading. Yeah. And so I'm I'm excited to to be the the face of that and, and just so many other cool projects. But for me, I... I love having these multiple hats. I love, you know, having this hustle mentality. I think moving to New York and and I love Georgia. I I do. But I think it's something about being in a big metropolitan city like that, especially New York, that I don't even think that is honestly even comparable to, to California, which I now live in L.A. But it's something about this energy and this everything is in the air and you just want to keep pushing yourself and saying, like, what else can I do? What else can I do? And and it's not necessarily the achievements. It's like, how far can I push myself in a good way? And that for me is is what I want to do. Okay, I have my podcast. Okay, I'm the host of an incredible new TV series on entrepreneurneur.com. Okay, I have a movie. Okay, I have a book. I now sit on the board of a few financial firms. And so I'm always looking of how can I continue to grow Lauren? How can I continue to push myself beyond whatever my limitations are? I am constantly putting myself in in spaces and places in these mindsets where um, I'm uncomfortable because the biggest growth comes from being in situations where you are uncomfortable. If you are at a place in your life and you're comfortable and you're comfortable with your salary and your friends and your lifestyle, you are not pushing yourself enough. You have to be good with being comfortable, with being uncomfortable. And that is where these biggest growths and these biggest opportunities come from. So I'm, I'm always like constantly trying to like push myself to the next level. I love that. And, you know, I can't I can't let you get away before we say where you can find more about you and the show. Just like asking you a little bit about your like finances personally, how you view them, because it's such a thing that, you know, it's like one of those we all are affected and need money. Right. And at a certain point, we have more than the baseline and we now can decide what we do with that, whether it's investing more and or living the lifestyle we want. So when it comes to Lauren and her personal philosophy on money, how you manage it, how you spend and invest it, is there just some things you would like to share with your thoughts around that? Like how you how you look at your own money? Yeah. So all of it, obviously, like how we navigate our personal finances comes from external voices and our upbringings and our colleagues and our friends. And so the first thing that I always talk about when it comes to money is what is your relationship with money? Tell me the adjectives that you use. Your relationship with money should be the same as a platonic or romantic relationship. And you should be using healthy adjectives. If you're not, You need to check in, which, again, is why I take it back to the most instrumental thing that you could do in your life is developing out a relationship with yourself. For me, my personal finance and even my investing journey has all been shaped, obviously, from my mom. And like she's always been good with her personal finances. And so she's always taught me budgeting and saving and living within my means and not wanting the latest greatest and like waiting if I do want something trendy or do want a materialistic item waiting like six months. And if I still want it, okay, then get it. But it's not anything that I do impulsively. And there was a point in my life where I couldn't do things impulsively. I can do things now impulsively. But the same girl that was working at the New York Stock Exchange making 12000 who is now making over you know half a million dollars a year, I still use those same things. So I'm not going to just live lifestyle inflation and ball out and go crazy because I have more money. Like that's just insane. That's how, that's how we lose money. 
Um, and then as, as far as investing, one of the things that I learned on the trading floor is that 90% of the men do not invest in the stock market. These are now men, people don't realize that, who have gone into their third recession and they don't believe that you can beat the game. My philosophy to that is like, you can't beat the game if you're not in the game, but you have to financially be in a good place to be in the game. With that being said, if you have credit card debt, you have student loan debt, you have revolving debt, nope, you should not be in the game. If you don't have a budget, you should not be in the game. If you don't have a savings or an emergency fund, which are two different things set up, you should not be in the game. Um, once you have those things and for people who are like fear of missing out, like what is meant for you will be for you. If you didn't get to invest in Amazon, like people were like, oh, like how would it have been if you would have invested in Amazon? I can't answer that. If How would it have been? It would have only been if I would have been able to. <laughs> there are other opportunities that will come my way, like Amazon, Tesla, or not the end all be all. Do what is right for you in that moment. Don't try to just do something just just because. So when it comes to investing, you know, I'm always doing my due diligence. I'm always researching what are the companies that I, that I want to participate in. And for me, I was able to spend two years on the floor really like understanding what is important to me and what I, what I, my personal philosophy when it comes to investing, what's important to me is ESG investing, environmental, social governance, investing. Long gone are the days for me where I'm just investing in the top 50 companies because they're the top 50 companies. If you are not an organization that has good retention practices when it comes to women of color and minorities, I'm not investing in your, in your company. If you're a corporation that is housed in areas that has lower socioeconomic groups and you're not doing anything for the community in which your building is locating, located, I am not investing in your company. If you don't believe in the environmental issues that are going on in this world, I'm not investing in your company. And so that makes that list a very short list of companies to invest in. I am a believer that all money is in good money. And so yes, there might be an upside in, in investing in XYZ company because they are XYZ company and they have this massive brand and they have great revenue. Again, back to this holistic interconnected approach. What are you doing for me? What are you doing for my people? What are you doing? Fill in the blanks. And if you're not doing those things, I'm sorry, you could have the best revenue and you could be the quote unquote best company there are other investors that that will happily invest in in your organization. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that those philosophies, because I think it's important to understand where you stand. And as you move forward, as you gain more information or just, you know, you, you gain more information, not externally, like, oh, what is X amount, you know, like Googling certain terms, but you gain more information internally by listening to yourself. Like you actually can make the, the decisions that are best for you. Okay, Lauren, thank you for this conversation. Please let everyone know where they can find more about the show that's going to be uh, premiering and then more about you and the projects that you're working on. Yes. Yeah, so everyone, please follow me on my Instagram, LA Simmons, or on LinkedIn, Lauren Simmons. And I frequently answer DMs messages. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out. And then, of course, I want everybody to watch our show, Going Public, premieres October 19th on entrepreneur.com. And you'll be able to simultaneously stream it on goingpublic.com. And yes, I'm so excited for you guys to see this journey and these incredible companies. And um, I will see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Lauren, I'm looking forward to seeing all the things like this show, all the things that you have in the future that's coming out. Um, I'm sure everyone else, too, will be like really interested to just following your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. OK, journeyers, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lauren. I mean, like at her age to be so confident and just she has such a sense of purpose and knowing what she wants out of life. I am inspired. So go ahead, Lauren. And again, if you like this interview, here's what I want you to do. So this is with all the episodes. The best thing to do to support the podcast, which you know, you're getting for free every week, I'm putting my all into this, guys, <laughs> is to follow the podcast. Just make sure you're following it wherever you listen and tell someone about it. That's it. And if you have a little time, take two seconds to review the podcast if you listen to Apple Podcasts. Also, whenever you're listening and you like something or you want to share this, share it with the world. Take a screenshot of you listening to this and put it on your Instagram. Tag me at Journey to Launch. You could also always tag the guest. Today's guest was Lauren Simmons. So tag Lauren 
at L.A. Simmons on Instagram. So I'm at Journey's Launch. Lauren is L.A. Simmons on Instagram too. Tag us. Let us know what you liked about the interview. Share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and get the word out that everyone needs to listen to this podcast and become a journeyer. Okay, don't forget, if you want to join Terry Ijeoma and I on October 27th to hear more about how to learn to trade as a side hustle or your full-time hustle to reach your goals, come join us. Go to journeytolaunch.com slash trade class. The class is happening on October 27th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. So come join us, journeytolaunch.com slash trade class. Don't forget, you can get the episode show notes for this episode by going to journeytolaunch.com or click the description of wherever you're listening to this. And you can still grab your jumpstart guide for free to help you on your journey to financial freedom by going to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart. If you want to support me and the podcast and love the free content and information that you get here, here are four ways that you can support me and the show. One, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you listen, whether that's Apple Podcasts, that purple app on your phone, your Android device, YouTube, Spotify, wherever it is that you happen to listen, just subscribe so you are not missing an episode. And if you're happening to listen to this in Apple Podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe there. I appreciate and read every single review. Number two, follow me on my social media accounts. I'm at Journey to Launch on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I love, love, love interacting with journeyers there. Three, support and check out the sponsors of this show if you hear something that interests you. Sponsors are the main ways we keep the podcast lights on here. So show them some love for supporting your girl. Four, and last but not least, share this episode, this podcast with a friend or family member or coworker so that we can spread the message of Journey to Launch. All right, that's it. Until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. Journeyers.